Professor Toop, uh, great to see you, uh, albeit uh, on screen. Yes. Uh, and I've been greatly looking forward to this conversation. Uh, you and I have, uh, of course, uh, spent some time already dis discussing the expected growth of strategic philanthropy uh, and the historic opportunity that this represents for institutions uh, like Cambridge, but also uh, the wider uh, social sector um, and uh, everything that, uh, Im that, that is impacted by it. Mm -hmm. uh, but first off, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you uh, and the university uh, and the Judge Business School, of course, for once again giving the Center for Strategic Philanthropy uh, a home uh, mm -hmm. within the University of Cambridge. Uh, as with many things strategic, it perhaps took some time to get its own strategic design right. Uh, but of course, that time uh, was itself a great investment uh, in setting it up for success uh, and, of course, to enable it to hit the ground running. Uh, so uh, thank you again. Well, thanks to, thanks to you, really, Batter, for your vision and in, in helping us move this forward. And, and of course, your very concrete support. It, uh, it wouldn't have happened without you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, as I just alluded to, Professor Stephen Toop uh, is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, a uh, scholar. Uh, prior to joining the University of Cambridge, he spent three years uh, as the Director of the Monk School of Global Affairs uh, at the University of Toronto, uh, and before that served uh, for eight years uh, as uh, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia, uh, and before that, uh, I believe it. Uh, uh, at McGill University as, as Dean of Law. He also has hands-on experience ha uh, running one of Canada's most respected philanthropic foundation, uh, the president as president of the Trudeau Foundation, supporting the uh, critical and creative thinkers who make uh, meaningful contribution to uh, social issues. Uh, as an expert in international law, uh, international legal theory, human rights, uh, and international development, uh, Professor Toop has uh, worked in a variety of roles uh, in the Canadian public sector, as well as uh, advising and working with a, in, with a number of international NGOs and intergovernmental agencies, uh, such as the UN. And he brings all of these uh, diverse experiences, uh, and plus many others I'm sure I haven't mentioned, to his stewardship of the University of Cambridge. And I've had the pleasure of getting to know uh, Professor Toop over the past couple of years. And it's always insightful to uh, hear him speak with uh, passion uh, and experience, of course, uh, about many of the issues that are on uh, today. Professor Toop, as we uh, reflected many times uh, uh, in advance of the establishment of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy, a disproportionate number of the world's fastest growing economies today can be found in the emerging markets with uh, trillions of dollars expected to be passed on to the next generation uh, of aspiring philanthropists uh, in these markets within the next uh, couple of decades. What impact do you think that this could have on the global economy and society uh, over the next few decades? And how can we help to prepare this next generation for these major shifts? Well, there's absolutely no question that we're seeing a, a fundamental correction, I'll call it, in the historic imbalance between the global north and the global south. Uh, and philanthropy is going to be uh, deeply affected and part of that rebalancing process, I think. So we're going to see philanthropic capital emerging much more from growth markets. Uh, and we're going to see, therefore, an influx of philanthropists. Uh, and, and I think, interestingly, many of them are going to be second generation philanthropists, families who've, who've done very well, uh, built a wealth, and then in the second generation are starting to think about how to deploy that wealth in ways that can reshape societies over time. And that's extremely exciting. Uh, but I also think, and I'll be honest, I think it's going to be a bit of a challenge for a lot of traditional uh, institutions uh, that have been used to the more foundation model, if I may put it that way, of uh, philanthropic funding. So I think what we're going to see more and more, and it's happening all around the world, but I think it will be even more driven by the Global South. We're seeing an interest in what I'll call uh, philanthropic investment and engagement, rather than simply uh, 
handing over resources for the best of all purposes. So I think we're going to start to see hybrid models, uh, partnerships being developed, social impact funds, and much more active engagement on the part of uh, philanthropists from the global south. It's, it's intriguing. I, I was looking at some of the statistics and uh, the Charities Aid Foundation World Giving Index shows us that more people are giving than ever before around the world, which is great news, and that the largest increase is coming from the global south, Indonesia, Kenya, Singapore, Malaysia, South Africa, the UAE. So this is going to have a tremendous impact on philanthropy globally over the course of the next couple of decades. So I, I see it as exciting and positive, although, as I said, there will be challenges. A defining feature of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy is that it, although it's housed, of course, proudly in Cambridge, it's properly and authentically reaching out of Cambridge and connecting uh, in practical and meaningful ways uh, with philanthropic and other uh, communities in the world's high growth markets. Um, it's, of course, recognized that this form of uh, localized collaboration is essential to the Center's mission. As the University of Cambridge itself becomes more global uh, in nature, uh, adapting to global shifts, what have you found to be the keys to doing this successfully as a, as a large uh, institution? A, a great question, because I, I do think that as one operates more and more in the global sphere, it requires different cultural instincts, if I may put it that way. And, and I think some of them really relate to uh, some similar learning uh, that took place in the development sector uh, over the course of the last uh, couple of decades. I think it's fair to say that both philanthropy and development uh, have historically been somewhat siloed, uh, competitive rather than collaborative in their approaches. Uh, I used to do some work in, in evaluating uh, development uh, initiatives all around the world, and it was always frustrating to see the number of siloed endeavors that were going on that were just not leveraging uh, effectively the resources that were being deployed. And I think universities also have to learn from that. And, and I, I'd say that the single greatest learning is that you actually have to listen to people on the ground. I like to say that universities are very good often at telling people to behave and what they should do. It's part of part of our natural instinct. But in this area, we also have to get better at listening. Uh, because the big questions that we all face around the world today, COVID, uh, challenges to democratic institutions, uh, all the issues uh, related to inequality, these are things that are not going to be dealt with without real collaboration. And philanthropy shouldn't be coming in and duplicating efforts that are already being made by others. We, we have to find ways of developing partnerships amongst NGOs, agencies like the World Bank, governments, academic institutions, and philanthropy. And that's absolutely at the heart of what we are trying to do at the Center for Strategic Philanthropy here at Cambridge. As, as you said, Batter, the goal is to be working with people on the ground, analyzing, collecting, and analyzing data, and then making it available and helping to build the kinds of partnerships and connections with like-minded organizations that will really allow us to reach scale, and I guess that's the biggest question. How do we make sure that the work we're doing is at scale, not just pilots all over the place, but learning from those pilots, figuring out how we can really make the world change uh, for the better? So I should just end uh, th this section by saying that uh, the uh, CSP is already beginning this process, and uh, it's soon going to issue its first full-scale report which is called Philanthropy in the Time of COVID-19, is the North-South balance of power finally shifting? So a really important question, and it's based on work that's being done with local stakeholders uh, in various parts of the world. Yeah, I know, and I uh, look forward to uh, and very excited about that launch, uh, hopefully within the coming weeks, which yes. is excellent. Um, one of the other uh, main pillars of the center's work is its uh, research programs. Uh, we just talked about uh, a report. 
It's recognized, of course, the research itself is a, is a means to an end and not necessarily an end in itself. The end objective is, of course, achieving some defined impact, which for the center is enhancing the form and, and practice of philanthropy um, in and from the world's uh, emerging markets. From your perspective, what are some of the main questions that uh, need to be answered in relation to the practice of philanthropy uh, in these high growth markets? And how can we ensure that this research is uh, one, fulfilling real needs, uh, and two, doesn't just gather dust uh, on shelves and actually gets into the hands of individuals and organizations that need to make the most of it? Well, I think it, it, it starts with this uh, premise of listening again and working the ground. Uh, there's no point in doing uh, abstracted research in this field that isn't connected to what people actually need to understand. Uh, the other piece that connects back to some of uh, our previous discussion is that philanthropy has historically, because of the somewhat siloed nature of its practices, not been an area where there's been a lot of good cross philanthropic data collection. So what we're trying to do at the center is work on the ground and try to coordinate uh, the information gathering so that we're actually bringing to bear in the discussion real data that matters to people who have to make decisions philanthropically and in terms of the work of their organizations. So we need to know who is giving, who is working with whom, and crucially, where are there gaps that actually need to be filled? And, and uh, I'm sure that we will discover there are many. Uh, the Center for Strategic Philanthropy is concentrating on emerging markets, as you say, particularly in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And there's a fundamental commitment to ensuring that this is impact-driven research, that it is eminently practical research. Look, believe me, there's nothing wrong with blue skies thinking uh, that's Cambridge historically has been brilliant at that. But for this kind of work, that's not what the need is. The need is to be working at the grassroots, talking and communicating with people who are actually trying to make decisions about how to make their communities better. And uh, that's an exciting opportunity. This, this notion of sort of community-based research, stakeholder engagement is fundamental uh, to the future of the center. And uh, I think it will actually make a really big contribution because of the dearth of data that currently exists. Exciting indeed, absolutely. In addition to uh, Cambridge, uh, as I've mentioned, of course, you've held uh, uh, positions with a number of other uh, institutions and education institutions, and you've also worked closely with other government agent with government agencies and international agencies. In addition to running a foundation, from these diverse sectorial experiences that uh, you have had, what do you think are the keys to facilitating successful collaborations uh, between academic institutions, businesses? governments, uh, and the social sector? You know, it, it is harder than we sometimes imagine. And I, I guess one should be a, a realistic about that. And, and I think that the reason it's harder is because the cultures of these organizations are often quite different. And the timeframes uh, for decision-making can be uh, different. And types of division the be different. So um, I think it's really crucial that as we engage in uh, partnerships that we're friends with and, and that we don't try to those differences don't exist and listen to each other and work them on a day-to-day -day basis. I, I have a lot of experience working in Afro development work, which you realize so strong. Sometimes when one thinks one's communicating, one isn't really hearing what the other person is saying. And so that is absolutely fundamental. It's back to this listening point, which I keep emphasizing. But I, I think the other piece that I would want to stress here is the power of diversity. Uh, again, the kinds of challenges we're facing will not not be solved by any sector alone. Government can't do it, business can't do it, academics can't do it, and philanthropists can't do it. We need to be working collaboratively, and that requires us to be open to a diversity of voices. And I have always believed, even within my own institutions, that we're stronger if we have diverse voices, because 
I think we start to interrogate things in different ways. And of course, we bring different lived experience uh, to uh, our decision making. So uh, it's crucial that we all together find ways to genuinely listen, to try to hear what other people are saying, to acknowledge differences of culture, and to be really, uh, uh, frankly, excited about voices that bring to the table different perspectives than our own. Yeah, absolutely. Pr prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we seem to be living in a world uh, that was becoming increasingly distrustful of expertise in a wide variety of fields, including academic expertise in some cases. How has this phenomenon in impacted institutions such as the University of Cambridge, if at all? And are you hopeful that the experience of the pandemic might begin to reverse some of these uh, unfortunate uh, trends or might it even accelerate them? And, and how would that uh, hamper our ability to come up with global solutions uh, to our global challenges? And it's a really difficult question because I think that there are contrary trends happening all at the same time and, and figuring out which of them will become more dominant over the next while is going to be hard to, to understand. So you're right that, you know, one of the trends we've definitely be, been seeing is this, this growth in what is often called populist sentiment and the idea that everyone's opinion is equally valid, uh, whether you know anything about a subject or don't know anything about a subject and that experts are pointy headed and they're self-interested. So all of that's been playing out. And yet at the same time with COVID, we desperate need for expertise to be brought in to give advice. But now we're also seeing a bit of a reaction against that expertise and the idea that, you know, we can't just rely on quotes, the science, because even scientists have different perspectives and different approaches and government has to take into consideration not only science, but politics and economics and all of these other things. So I think we're in a, a period of really deep complexity when it comes to societies understanding how to process the information, I even say the norms out of institutions right now. At the same time, I don't want to put too much emphasis on, on the old bugbear of social media, uh, because everyone loves to uh, pick on social media, and I, I'm one of them. But it is fair to say that with social media, you can amplify really crazy, unfounded ideas extremely and to try to combat that is, is really important, it seems to me. And one of the ways that we have to do that as institutions is build the sense of trust that we are actually operating in the public interest. And a place like Cambridge, uh, obviously, I think does operate in the public interest, but sometimes in the way that we can project our advice or our, our analysis, it can sound, frankly, condescending. It can sound as if we're disengaged from the real challenges that people are facing on the ground. And that is precisely what the Center uh, for Strategic Philanthropy does not want to do. It wants to step in and again, be part of a conversation with people on the ground so that we're not coming in as disconnected experts, but as people profoundly integrated into the wider community. I also think the convening power of a place like the Center for Strategic Philanthropy is going to be really important because I think it's going to be a place, I hope, that will empower young up and coming philanthropists to find their voice too, and, and thereby to amplify it from the global south into the wider world. So that's really uh, one of the fundamental hopes uh, of the center. And I think it will be powerful for the university as a whole because it will help undermine that sense that somehow we're disconnected from what's happening in the world that people are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. At least that's my hope. And mine too, absolutely. And just to go back to what you said, something you said before in relation to trust and the mistrust perhaps that's developing, uh, you know, and despite the fact that there is so much information out there and we've had this huge uh, scale up of data and information and perhaps noise as well, yes. uh, you some that people aren't listening. So that really goes back to, to your point in the old adage that God gave us two ears and one mouth so, so yes. we can listen twice as much as we speak, which unfortunately doesn't uh, often happen. Uh, but I think uh, that is absolutely um, a trend and, and hopefully 
hopefully, uh, I'd like to think that the pandemic and some of the lessons learned from it will help to uh, accelerate more reliance on, uh, on the right sort of expertise. But again, expertise that properly listens uh, yeah. and understands the issues and the problems that that expertise is trying to address. Exactly. That's speaking to real issues that people are struggling with day to day. Absolutely. So, uh, Professor Toop, uh, your insights are not only uh, greatly appreciated, but also very important to guide uh, the center's team, execution of the vision uh, and the mission of the center. Uh, and, and whilst this was, uh, of course, an unconventional year to start anything or to launch anything, uh, it's very encouraging to, uh, to hear and to see uh, the center get off to a strong start. And I have no doubt that with your continued support and guidance, the center will uh, meet and indeed exceed uh, its already uh, ambitious goals uh, and really make a, a meaningful and measurable uh, strategic uh, impact um, on the philanthropic landscape uh, in these fastest growing regions uh, of the world. Thank you again. And uh, I very much look forward to speaking with you again soon uh, and with a bit of luck uh, in person. Thank I'm you. I sure hope so, Bader. It's great to speak with you even this way. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.